Are you interested in figuring out what makes a great clinic even greater? And something that Japanese acupuncturists do every single day and are so, so mindful about. Well, let's get into it. We're going to get a bit of our Marie Kondo on, and this is going to be, as you guessed it, a cleaning video. What's something that I recommend that you do quite frequently in your clinic and something that I've noticed that not all acupuncturists do. Now, if you're new to this channel, my name is Maya Suzuki and I run Shink University, a lifetime mentorship and membership program that helps teach acupuncturists from around the world the basics and fundamental techniques of Japanese acupuncture help really bridge their TCM acupuncture to beautiful Japanese medicine techniques and bridge those two together so you can be a better and more confident and competent practitioner. So don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the little bell to be notified when we get new videos coming out. It's completely free to you and you can always change your mind. So I got the idea for this video because I saw in a group um, a post about a practitioner saying that someone had put in her Google review that it was a beautiful treatment, loved the skill of the practitioner and the practitioner was so personable, but her clinic looked really gross and then therefore she got three stars or two stars or something like that. Um, this is something obviously that, you know, with a little grit and just a little bit of mindfulness that, that can really take your practice to another level. I learned how to do this when I was practicing, um, actually apprenticing in Japan under Taikenjo at Accure Acupuncture Clinic, an amazing fertility clinic in Shibuya, Tokyo, um, in Japan. And he told me the first thing that you learn how to do when you're on the job there is how to clean the toilet. And you're like, what? No, we don't have people that we pay to do that. We actually clean the toilet ourselves, the apprentices and the acupuncturists, depending who is on staff. And he told me I cleaned the toilet and I had missed something. And he, he came back and he said, well, you've missed that. And I was like, oh, I just didn't see it. And he's like, well, how can you expect to see and really understand what's in your patient's body and help to clean that when you can't even clean behind a toilet? You can't even see what's dirty behind a toilet. Uh, what he said is completely true and it's really stuck with me until this day. So in the spirit of transparency, we're going to go through and clean my office together. So here we go. Okay, so I always do an initial vacuum underneath my station just to make sure I didn't drop any guy tubes or just something crazy isn't on the floor. Um, and then I want to go in and really clean top down. I try to do this at least once a week uh, just to make sure that there's no dust bunnies in the clinic. Now for my station here, um, and we would do this in the clinic in, in Acura as well, I really do take everything off. I honestly just use alcohol to clean almost everything um, simply because it, one, it works really, really well. And two, you know, it kills all the viruses that we don't want in our clinic. Um, while I'm doing this, I also take a minute to, of course, restock. Like my incense is getting really, really low. So I'm going to take a minute to restock. I'll clean the inside of that container as well. You know, just taking apart all the little things and making sure everything just looks really, really clean. And because of this, you know, this isn't a place that honestly most of my patients look. Most of my patients come straight in, they sit straight on the bed. None of them are even going to look at my little station here, but in my opinion, it's these little details that really can make or break your clinic. All right. So, voila, we have a clean station. All clean. All right. Okay, so in here, I actually have my needle top. This is like um, a little bit higher grade than a Wakakusa. And I use this for my for my needle top moxa, even though I don't do a lot of needle top moxa, um, simply because it just doesn't give off as strong a smell and not as much smoke. Um, I've found that with some of the lower grade moxas for needle top, it's just a bit too smoky for me. And so I used to look, I like to use, spend a little bit more money and just be a little bit more refined. Now, if you're one of my students, you know that one of my biggest no-nos is putting moxa 
in an airtight container that cannot breathe. However, this Moxa in particular, I'm not super worried about because it's a grade that I purchased, honestly, that I don't really, really like. Um, so I'm not just, I'm not super worried about it getting a little bit more dense. And honestly, I use it for my needle top Moxa. Um, the reason why I'm using it for my needle top Moxa is look how beautifully, like, yeah, I can use this. I can definitely use this for direct, but it just, it turns into, ooh, there we go. It turns into needle top moxa so incredibly quickly that it's just super awesome to use. So um, again, if you're using this for direct moxa, I would obviously recommend it being in a box like this and making sure that it just has a lot of space to it. Also notice that I have some stick on moxa here and then I also have some senenku moxa that I keep in here as well. Um, I keep the big sheet here. This is Choseki simply because it's a little bit hotter than the sending cue that I have, the stick on that I have. All of my patients get take home homework to do um, stick on moxa on their body. Uh, and this is just the brand that's sold really readily in the United States. So this is the brand that I have them do. It's easier to just show them, be like, this is how it's going to look. And that's how you're going to do it. Um, so I have a little bit, a little showcase board and sometimes I will use that as well. So you're gonna notice that I have two different types of incense that I use regularly, and you'll, it'll show up all the time when I talk about moxa. One is, of course, this thinner moxa. I absolutely love it because it doesn't give off as much ash, um, and it does not smoke as much either. It has a really, really nice mild smell. Uh, I love, love this incense. However, every once in a while, I'll wanna use this thicker incense when I really wanna warm a point, almost like a pole moxa, actually. Um, however, it's very rare when I ever use this, which is why I, I've had like two and a half sticks in here forever. Um, if you're interested in getting this incense in particular, just comment below and I can send you the link for where I get my incense. Okay, so I have two different incense trays at my station. I have a smaller little incense. This is the one that I kind of like carry around the bed. And then I have a really big guy. I use the big guy when I'm using needle top moxa because I like to put water in it and then put the uh, the moxa out right away. Um, and I also use it sometimes when I'm using my takegyu. Some of you know this is ontake, so I use it for the takegyu. And then also when I'm using my Nepalku, um, which is Nepalese moxa. The most commonly used needles in most Japanese acupuncture styles and when I say needles, I mean needle size, is going to be blue sarins and red sarins. Blue sarins are about 20 by 50. Red sarins are going to be 16 by 40. Uh, I've seen some people do 20 by 40 with these as well. However, um, most common size, when you're in acupuncture school, you almost only use the blue size, um, and you do it only with silver needles because that's traditionally how you're supposed to practice. Because of that, I would say with most of my patients, I'm using a blue sarin. Um, not because I'm forcing them to be utilizing a needle that's bigger for them, but simply because I feel that it's the most powerful and it feels just like any other needle would anyway, so why not? So of course you should probably do this daily if you are a little bit more hands-on with more of the things in your station. However, for me, honestly, um, the things that I touch daily um, are really aren't that many things. So what I do is I always wash my hands. I have a little sink in my, in my room and I'll wash my hands before I touch anything from my needle dispensary, and then I'll take out a brand new needle, I'll put it in my clean tray, um, which I alcohol in between each patient, of course, and then I will continue on my way. So the only thing that I'm really touching with dirty hands um, is my ashtray, my lighter, um, the needle trays, and my marker. And I just make sure to go through and to, um, to sanitize those after every visit with a client, if possible. Um, you know, anything that I touch that I think needs to be recleaned, then I'll just do it in between. However, for the most part, I get to be pretty clean about things. So usually I only do a big clean, maybe once a week or once every two. Sanitize the sanitizer. You, know, you gotta sanitize everything. All right, 
So my tray is now clean. Now I'm gonna go through and just wipe down counters, put away all my things, and then I'm going to re-vacuum everything. So one of the things I try very hard to do is that when um, I'm putting away sheets, everything is going to be folded the exact same way. So it looks for the most part pretty uniform in here. Um, no matter what I'm looking at, like for example, this sheet is a little bit off, so I'm just gonna put them all in the same way just so it looks nice and pretty. And that way, in case I open up my cabinet, all my patients see is just something that looks really, really put together and well done and thoughtfully put out. Okay, so that includes all storage units, everything in your clinic. Now, this has kind of been taken apart because I was taking some things out to stock up, but everything in your storage unit should look very beautiful when you open it up. So that way, when your client sees it, they see something that's been um, very thoughtfully put together and that it looks organized and neat. And so whatever you have to do to puzzle that together, I think you should definitely take the time and energy to do it. And I know some people are like, oh, that just seems like a little bit of a waste of time, Maya. Um, but I can really guarantee to you that if you take the time and energy to do this and really puzzle it together so that way it looks beautiful or at least looks like someone took some time and energy to do it, then patients are gonna notice that. So for example, here, do you see how it's like not stacked well? I would highly recommend taking this apart. So for example, in here I have my big box of, it's almost gone now, but I have like all my rough moxa in here. I don't use this quite as much. So I'm gonna keep this guy on the bottom I definitely don't use stick moxa very much, which is why he's all the way in the back. Um, and so just taking the time to at least make things look even from the front, uh, it just makes, again, it, it, it really does help um, when you do need to grab something that maybe you're missing for patients to see the inside of a closet and not see a really huge mess, but see something that's been thoughtfully put together and has um, someone's just really taken the time to organize it and make sure it's clean and looks really really beautiful okay so this is just a little darker corner of my office because it's a little late here so I apologize for the poor lighting but this is my little play area that I have available to my smaller patients who maybe don't feel as comfortable being on a treatment bed or perhaps brother and sister who have to tag along for mom's treatment or for baby's treatment. So the next thing that I'm gonna do is just spruce up the play area so that way when the kids come in and the moms come in, it looks a little bit like a staged play area. Um, it makes everyone a little bit more excited to play with the toys. Now that I've cleaned up most of the back room, the last thing that I need to do is really just look at my shelves, make sure that they're not dusty, clean up around the sink, which I usually do in the morning anyway, but I'm just going to add it into this video at the end, and then do a quick vacuum of the back office and then go clean the front. Okay, so let's do a quick vacuum. Okay, now that I've really cleaned my back room, I wanna go ahead and just do the whole thing with the front room again. It's not really rocket science, so I'm just gonna go ahead and speed along through this. So that was by no means like a full on deep clean in my office. But I thought it was really important to just touch on the subject that sometimes the little things that we do in our office can really make a huge impact on our patients. And to be quite honest, if you come into a space and it's really clean and you know it's clean and you know all the little things about that space, then it's going to be a lot easier for you to then go into your patient's body, into their space, and help them to clean up. I think in the beginning, especially when you're an apprentice, that means that you should learn how to really, really clean. 
and how to support not only the practitioner but the patient the moment they walk in the door. One of the things that I used to do when I was working at Acura is we would actually have an electric vacuum that we could take all the way downstairs from the seventh floor all the way down to the first and we would take a broom and a dustpan as well and we would actually dust and sweep all around the front foyer of the building, inside the building, vacuuming the elevator all the way up to our floor. So it's just really, really important that um, every single thing that you can control about your space is really controlled. So that way, when the patient comes in, all you really have to do is help them. You don't have to worry about the space that they're in. So the next time that you approach your patient and you're like, you know, I'm really unsure what to do with this patient. I don't know how to treat them. I don't know where to start. I'd love for you to start really simply and being like, okay, let's first just clean up the dust bunnies. Where are the dust bunnies in this patient's body? What needs to be cleaned up and arranged beautifully and looked and made to look beautiful and simple. Keep your treatment simple, beautiful, and really, really clean. The same principles that I would say that you should have for cleaning your office or even decorating your office, even though I'm not a professional decorator. Um, yeah, and that's just kind of how I approach everything. So if you liked my OCD cleaning techniques, and of course, if you like this channel, please don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the little bell to be notified when we put up new videos. And of course, for those who have been with this channel forever, thank you so much for continuing to watch and continue to geek out with Japanese acupuncture. And for those who are new to this channel, I'm so excited that you are here and that you are learning. Please don't forget to comment below on anything that you might have taken away from this video, or if you do something similar, or something was surprising or different than what you've been trained in. I'd love to hear your comments and your feedback. And until I see you next time, happy practice.